So welcome to this week's midweek to this midweek webinar, which is the first of 2021. Uh, my name is Franz Kruger. I'm head of department at Wits Journalism. Who would have thought a year ago that now, in March 2021, the world would still be struggling to get on top of the COVID crisis? I remember thinking at the time it would be a matter of weeks, perhaps a month or two, and we would be back to normal. And I think a lot of people felt like that. The kind of remote teaching we were doing seemed a stopgap measure. I think the technical term is em emergency remote teaching. So it's a term that was used at WITS. Um, it seemed a stopgap measure just to keep things going until the storm blows over. But weeks turned into months and here we are. I think few people properly realized what the new normal really meant when they used it. And here we are, it's another year of COVID. Journalism schools at this end of the earth have started a new academic year under these conditions. I always think particularly of those students who are starting their studying um, in this way remotely, missing out on the classroom and all of the interactions with their colleagues. That's so important to a university experience. So we thought it would be a good moment to continue the discussion about teaching journalism under these conditions. Year two, as we said, of teaching journalism under COVID. So I'd like to introduce um, the panelists that are joining us. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Monica Chibita, who is Professor and Dean of the Faculty of Journalism, Media and Communication at the Uganda Christian University. Uh, Marion Walton is Associate Professor in the School of Film and Media Studies at the University of Cape Town. And Zoe Titus is Director um, of the Namibia Media Trust in Vintuk. I thought we could start uh, by asking each of the panelists to talk briefly about what they learned last year, what they're taking forward to 2021, and what they might do differently. Then we'll see where the discussion takes us. And we hope those of you who've joined us um, for, for the webinar will join in. Uh, there's a chat function um, as well as the usual Q&A function to do so. Um, I don't think we have a very large crowd today. Um, I guess Zoom is uh, exhausting in the long run and uh, people are also really busy. So we can take the opportunity to really have um, uh, you know, engage much more directly than perhaps we would otherwise be able to do with a big crowd. So let me ask uh, Monica to kick us off. What did you learn last year? What are you taking forward? And what have you learned not to do in 2021? Yeah. Mm. Um, last year, I think, told me that uh, we are not in control. I think that's the first thing I learned is we are not in control. And uh, we may think we are, but we really are not. And we, it called upon, I think, a lot of flexibility, a lot of, I don't know. There are things uh, I, I just thought were unimaginable that we had to deal with. I mean, universities being closed suddenly without warning and not knowing when they'll open again. In our case, salaries being cut abruptly, not knowing when they will be restored, contracts suspended and so on. Uh, all kinds of things. In terms of the classroom, it was very difficult to, to deal with student inquiries as they asked about, you know, what next, uh, what will we do now? Will we be able to graduate? And you had no answers for them and you had to keep telling them there were no answers. You also had to learn the humility of communicating one thing today and communicating a completely opposite thing the following day. And what will we take into the new year? I think that flexibility, I, I, I will carry with me into the new year. But I think another thing that for me has happened is that I, I realize that we need to be extremely intentional in whatever we teach so that we can optimize the moment while we have it. And so in terms of alignment of our teaching outcomes, our activities, our assignments, and so on, I think I've learned that. I'm sure there'll be a chance to say other things later. So this flexibility, of course, is something that universities are not always very good at, right? I mean, universities are organizations built on you know, centuries of tradition, of bureaucracy and so on. So it's a bit of a strain to have to show that kind of flexibility. Did you find that a particular challenge, Monica? 
Um, it wasn't a problem on my side. <laughs> it was a problem on, on the part of the university administration because that, that's where, I mean, the, the, the departments and faculties usually have no difficulty being flexible, but usually there are things above you that you have to observe and all. So it was a little difficult for the university, but I think a point came when the university decided that they would decentralize academic decision making and, and ask every faculty find out what works best, how best to organize their exams, and, and so on and so forth. So it wasn't mm. difficult for us. It was just difficult, I think, for the administration. Mm, exactly. Um, uh, you spoke earlier on, um, I think it was before we actually went live, about the fact that you're, you have a sort of hybrid model. Mm. Uh, what does that look like in, in practical terms? Yeah, so when the lockdown happened, of course, everything stopped. Uh, there was no teaching whatsoever. Then we, we, our university attempted to teach online and government said that was not possible because we would leave out many people. So we, would, we should wait until the situation normalizes. We waited, the situation didn't normalize. And then, they, and then government announced that online teaching was the best solution. And, and, and completely forgot that they had prohibited it a few months earlier. So then we started teaching online only. But this year, we now have a model where we, we have, we initially took in the finalist years in our faculty, particularly because that's the year that does the practical, mostly the practical courses. So we brought in the final years to study face to face. And then a month later, we invited the other two years, we have three years, we invited the other two years back and the, and the MA students. Um, but, but now they don't study all the time face to face. So you teach two weeks face to face and then two weeks online, but they are on campus. They don't go away because it's too expensive. It's too complicated and too much exposure. So we have that model where the students are all on campus, but they are not all studying at the same time partly because we want to optimize the space. Mm -hmm. So, and, and what, what has it done to the sort of throughput? I mean, have you had far higher failure rates? Or are you finding that students need to repeat? I think the greatest, the, the most difficult challenge has been dropout, dropout rates. Mm -hmm. We've had more students drop out than we've ever had before. Um, the, the performance hasn't really changed that much. The levels of plagiarism have gone up and we've had to deal with that. But the performance for the good students hasn't really gone down, but we've had the number of students just fail to come back. Some for financial reasons, some we don't know because we've lost touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. These challenges are really significant and I suppose we'll hear from others the kind of um, experiences that they had, uh, many of which I think Will, will echo what you've said. Um, Marion, talk to us about what have, what's been happening at UCT. Hi, France. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi, yeah, I think actually I really don't, I had a whole set of slides prepared, but having heard Monica, very, very similar. So, um, you know, that incredible uh, need for humility and flexibility from last year, I think, um, interesting to hear from Monica how you've combined face-to-face um, -face teaching and online on campus because this is where we've ended up at UCT as well this year and we've only just started last year so although it's mid-March um, we don't necessarily have a full um, account yet of how mm. this new model is working looking at numbers rising as as Franz pointed out um, you know wondering about whether um, campus is going to be available as a resource to our students for much longer. I think that's our crucial question because last year in our lo-fi mode, uh, we simply were not able to start a new cohort of video students. So, um, you know, it sounds like you have a year of video training. Um, we have 18 months of video training. And um, last year, we were just about able to complete our 2019 co cohort by, by hook or by crook. Um, and I've got a couple of, uh, you know, great things that we did with them that I would like to share also because we, sh we, we 
um, got these ideas from our networks. We literally got working journalists contributing audio, you know, audio clips for us to use for teaching students remotely and so on. Um, but also because the, our, our successes, I think we do have to feel humbled by the fact that we were not able to run our 2020 cohort. So in the middle of the year, when we were still in lockdown, we were supposed to be starting a new video training cohort and that wasn't possible. We kept saying, you know, in two months time, we'll be back on campus, don't worry students, eventually, this year, I remember my colleague Martha Evans actually crying in a Zoom call to the students who were still thinking that they might be able to compress all that training into one year. And um, it turned out simply not possible, not because of our lack of willingness to be flexible, but just the time and space. So there wasn't time to compress 18 months of teaching into the 12 months when we started the year in mid-March and our usual summer term is, was also totally compressed. So we usually have an extra you know, slot where we can compress a, a, a kind of boot camp video training course, but that was just not available this year because of changes from our late matric exams. And um, the other reason apart from time was space. So our televisions, amazing television studio, in the basement of the Baxter Theatres, unfortunately underground and had no proper air conditioning, you know, not wasn't compliant according to the university's own requirements. So we sort of feel like in this Kafkaesque situation where we're dealing with different, uh, you know, regulations and what's considered acceptable levels of ventilation for teaching, how many students can fit into our computer labs and um, there was really just too much pressure. So those students who usually would have done 18 months of training are leaving this year, if that's what they choose, to, if they choose not to take leave of absence, they'll be leaving with a three-year BA and a six-month video production course, which again, we're hoping we'll be able to launch in, in July. So, you know, learning from what we can do quite a bit um, with the students without uh, access to those uh, facilities, but we know there's certain things that we have to have them with cameras, with access to proper bandwidth and in our labs with the software. And unfortunately, if we'd gone ahead without that, there would have been students, UCT, you know, massive inequalities between our students. So there were students who we were pretty sure we could have trained online only, but we also knew that that would be incredibly unfair to the students who who didn't come with that cultural capital you know home situation um, basic um, support available for their academic but also kind of digital and multimedia production work uh, coming from home so that yeah that is um, unfortunately the the you know very humbling realization that despite the resources that UCT has, it wasn't actually, and our will, it wasn't possible to preserve that one cohort fully. Um, and but also kind of learning what was possible, um, you know, for the year before, and hopefully for those students um, getting six months in the second half of 2021. Sure. Thanks very much. Um, was there something you wanted to share by way of, of, of video or, or, or slides or? Um, yeah, I just, I have a few um, curriculum, you know, components that I think my colleagues and here yeah, I'm really kind of a bit embarrassed to be talking about it on my own because so many people work together. It was such an incredible experience of uh, colleagues collaborating around teaching which at a research university is quite a challenging thing to get everybody to focus on a you know, a teaching challenge, but um, everybody pulled together and I, you know, got a few great stories to tell about what we were able to pull off in the context of having had to, to cancel a whole cohort um, of teaching. So yeah, if you want to maybe ask me at some other point, I'm happy to share those. Uh, why not share them right now? Okay, I just have to share the screen. So give me a sec. Okay, no problem.
Right, so I think the, these are just a couple of our keepers from our curriculum. Um, maybe I should mention uh, yeah, what we will definitely change. Um, so one of the big things that we've changed this year is that we're trying to pay our tutors better. So to understand for our tutors who are doing a lot of online teaching um, that we need to reduce their grading loads and um, their, their class sizes if we're going to actually have them communicating as much as is required for, for teaching online. So I know this is, you know, this is actually also even at UCT where we do are continually reminded that we're in a very privileged position. Uh, we are actually unsure of whether we'll be able to remunerate tutors um, in the way that we'd actually want to because our budgets are still not finalized for, for 2021. Um, we're really trying to bring in a lot more in-person meetings outdoors. So I think we understand transmission a, a lot better and that it would be possible for us to do things like walk and talks with students, um, social meetings, just to kind of build in some social components um, to even the courses which we are running online. And then I think this has also got a big question mark for me, like an awareness of burnout um, and how our kind of full-time Zooming, um, the toll that that has taken on people and particularly the heavy load on conveners of courses. So um, uh, the, where the buck stops often is the convener who needs to kind of make everything uh, work. And um, I think that role was particularly taxing last year. So hopefully we'll be, um, we'll be able to um, adjust workloads so that conveners have this time and the space to deal with all these changes that we continually having to make in our new flexible, flexible orientation. Um, so yeah, these are just the contributions by my colleagues that I was particularly impressed by last year when people had to pull together and kind of find a new way of completing that uh, 2019 co cohort with the, you know, just the making the point that they'd actually got video training in the nine months before lockdown started. So we weren't working with students who had absolutely no practical training at this point. Um, there were some very, very creative uh, assignments that were set. I'm thinking of my colleagues, uh, Julia Kane, Diani Mastel, who set an assignment, Life Under Lockdown. And I think they benefited here from all these, uh, you know, Zoom networks that flourished at the time of our first lockdown. They were uh, amazingly uh, creative in adapting toolkits that were often developed for, you know, people working in the North, global North, with all the bandwidth that they could ever want and all the equipment that might, you know, great cell phones and so on. Um, but my colleagues were able to adapt these toolkits for our context, for this mobile, low file, very low data context of video and journalism production. And I really want to applaud them for that. I think a lot of our research into digital inequalities in South Africa, this really became an important, seems like a theoretical topic but it became quite an important introduction whenever we talk to students about digital and remote methods of journalism. So that question of who's being left out when we're doing all our interviews like this, um, what, you know, what are the voices that, are, that have always been excluded from South African journalism um, and how much more is that the case under kind of COVID conditions? Um, and there, um, my own research, but with colleagues from WITS, um, Indra Dalal, and from Rhodes, um, Alech Squirn was really amazing resource because we'd actually developed um, narrative profiles, so diaries of people living in the most disconnected ways in South Africa spaces. And these um, profiles were given to students as something for them to think about in terms of their own experiences of being disconnected and their own sense of digital inequality within UCT, where um, probably about five to eight percent of students were so cut off that they actually needed distance learning um, provisions to be made for them last year. Um, and then I think uh, Herman Bassemann, uh, my colleagues, research into verification. So this just became a much more intense focus in our curriculum. 
and in fact has led um, Hermann to really um, great new research projects. And I think based on a sense of verification beyond just fact checking, so understanding cultural, um, people's cultural need um, to share information even when it is misinformation and how journalists can appeal to the sense that people have of wanting trustworthy information. So I think that that really the kind of a research driven uh, contribution to our practical journalism curriculum was invaluable. And then finally, I think work that I've done, um, Leslie Cowling from Wirtz started this with me a couple of years ago, um, but also Harry Dugmore from Rhodes, working on data journalism and thinking through uh, problems with students' numeracy and how to get students to think about data about the pandemic as something constructed uh, rather than, you know, scary numbers from their maths class. And so I think with all those four uh, components of what we did in our teaching, we were pretty successful and we'll continue keep you know, using them um, in, in future. And I'd just like to link everybody to this. I'll post the link into the chat in a minute. Um, this is a great audio cast that my colleague, uh, Julia Kane worked on with her student, uh, Megan Daniels, which actually brought together contributions from a whole range of researchers um, who responded to our desperate call for, please share us your techniques. How do you go about using uh, remote rep reporting techniques? And so um, they edited that into this audio cast, which was used as part of the um, learning materials for, um, for the students doing the life under lockdown assignments. And it was, uh, I thought, a great example of how we as academics could be working in this community of practice uh, with working journalists and our students, connecting them in that way. But again, with that sort of sense of humility of what do we have to contribute? Um, in return, what, do, what can we give? And I guess that's the, the question that I'd like to end with. We um, benefited a lot from being ne networked in this way. In what ways can we uh, continue to connect uh, with journalists in the workplace and um, use our new flexibility to benefit the practice, practice of journalism in, um, on the continent as a result? That I would say is probably about it. Great. Thanks so much, Mary. And that's really most interesting. And it really, to me, illustrates how, uh, how important actually these discussions are. I mean, we, we're kind of thinking down these tracks in our little boxes. Um, and uh, it's just really critical to exchange both materials and ideas. Um, one quick question, um, whether you found that in terms of actual tools that you were asking journalists to, uh, students to work with, um, whether you were moving, you know, more towards, uh, say, the use of mobile phones and such like, um, and how you assess how far that goes in terms of the, uh, imparting the kind of skills that they will need um, once they graduate. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the hu it's a huge area of skill in its own right. And I think we benefited a lot from um, existing resources on mobile journalism, which are out there which unfortunately just don't, don't really consider, um, you know, access to the network. So there's that sense that you're the roving mobile journalist and that you can upload and download at company expects, I suppose. But that sense of being cut off, of literally bleeding every time you have to pay for data, um, that, wasn't, that wasn't really part of the picture that we had to then deal with. So I think hence, our multimedia teaching really shifted um, even within that multimedia space. We were heavily focused on writing, research and writing, and on audio. Um, so those, um, those became much kind of stronger instruments, if you like, in the multimedia orchestra. But the reason that we canceled our, our degree this year, not the whole degree, but we canceled one cohort was that we didn't feel we could graduate students with a degree in film and media production. And they'd never really had that opportunity to work with, cam with cameras. Um, mm. So, you know, or that they just had, if we get what we want, which is a, a, a good COVID friendly venue for the second half of the year, that they'd only had six months. I mean, we know what our students projects look like after six months. 
And um, we didn't really feel that that was the degree that they would be paying, paying a lot more for. So all our production courses cost more and also would be signaling that they had certain skills. So we felt it was just it more ethical to communicate with them, um, to engage with them about other alternatives for them, to give them options. So some of them will take an extra six months to finish next year. Um, and others will, I suppose, finish with a BA. And we've also talked to them about the many other ways in which they can continue their training, that they're not, you know, the, the degree from UCT is not necessarily the only way that they can learn. And I think that has been another quite humbling realization for many of us. Mm, thank you. Thanks very much. So, I mean, you, the Namibia Media Trust, of course, is mostly involved with um, sort of in um, uh, the training of working journalists, right? Um, tell us how things have unfolded for you, what you're taking forward, what you're doing differently. You were telling us earlier about work with Community Road in the very far more north of, of, of um, Namibia. I mean, that's hard at the, at the, at the best of times. Uh, it must be even harder now. Tell us what's changed or what is changing for you. You're on mute. Sorry, there we go. Thank you, Franz, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, and thanks for pointing that out. Um, at the Namibia Media Trust, um, um, our training is... Um, we're not a tertiary institution, so our focus is on media advocacy. Um, our focus as a media advocacy, media development organization is really on workshop-based training, targeting young and mid-career journalists. Um, so, yes, um, 2020 was, for us, was a year of hits and misses, um, one that uh, demanded new thinking about the modes of delivery of training and particularly the content um, based on the, on the evolving needs prompted by the pandemic. Um, all of a sudden, <clears throat> journalists were immediately required to be health experts reporting professionally on this unprecedented event. Um, and few people considered that journalists themselves were in the center of this pandemic, living in and experiencing it themselves. So these were the issues um, that we had to consider in our approach in, in, in 2020. Um, so then just an immediate response um, to the need for information and training on reporting COVID-19. Um, I think one of the most successful platforms we launched um, is what we call our Ask the Experts sessions, um, where we provided an online platform, just one hour, um, exclusively for working journalists to pose questions to a diverse range of COVID-19 experts. Um, the reason for that is in the normal it's a press conference setup. A journalist would be uh, be given an opportunity to pose a question. Um, you get a response, and, and that's the end of that cycle. Um, there is no interaction and really opportunity to interrogate the issue. So the Ask the Expert sessions, uh, we believe, provided a learning and a conversational approach. When um, and when eventually, based on our monitoring. We found that it most definitely uh, improved the quality of uh, reporting on, on, on the pandemic. Um, also, taking the, the, the online route um, and having to be flexible and, and creative, um, our social me media verification training via WhatsApp was a hit. So, um, yeah, the the phone, the mobile phone as a training platform has become uh, incredibly important for us in delivering um, um, uh, uh, training courses. So um, just to go back, I, I think um, 2020 made it quite clear that most institutions did not have the technical knowledge or skills to sustain new modes of teaching also having suffered uh, cutbacks in funding and staffing capacity, we too uh, had a challenge with that. Um, 
it meant that um, at very short notice, we had to bring on people with more technical capacity, um, how to manage a proper Zoom recording, how to facilitate uh, WhatsApp training. Um, but yeah, now I think that um, there's general acceptance that, that COVID-19 is, is going to be with us for, for a long time. Um, and the so-called emergency response um, that we've all taken to learning online will, will become part of the new normal. Um, both, um, I mean, the, the, the uh, uh, previous speakers have uh, highlighted the drawbacks, you know, the fallout uh, probably being most traumatic in South Africa from, from news reports, that being the issue of access, affordability of data, uh, tools, um, and the growing digital divide that, um, and how this has affected the poorest of, 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 of students. I don't think that any African country um, has successfully implemented e-learning, be it at primary, secondary, or tertiary levels, and students are upset and disenfranchised journalists uh, themselves are um, unclear about the future. So it's uh, increasingly obvious now for us, let's say in year two, that COVID-19 recovery, if that is at all possible, will be slow. Um, I am now in year two, uh, becoming increasingly aware of the psychosocial impact of COVID-19. Many students are, are, are barely coping. Um, many journalists um, are barely coping. Issues of mental health is uh, now um, a major topic of discussion in, in most newsrooms. We have to be aware and, and empathize um, with the understanding that some have lost family members. Um, Parents have been retrenched, uh, husbands, um, wives um, have been retrenched. So this is the environment that you have to consider uh, in the context of, of, I mean, of all of this. Um, it's increasingly obvious, and I, I recently read an article by an Indian journalist, uh, Preeti Nalu, um, who said that, uh, the media and media education centers must transform its approaches, must increase its um, connectivity and cooperation in presenting the larger picture if it wishes to be instrumental in the transformation of our societies beyond this uh, uh, pandemic. That's a huge task, not as simple as it sounds and, and one that we are also grappling with. So France at a very, very practical level during the hard lockdown and hours lasted quite long. I mean, like South Africa and most other countries, um, um, we had the, the, the declaring of uh, a national emergency. You had a different phrase for it, but that's a time when we uh, took the opportunity. And I know that universities couldn't necessarily do that, um, but we took the opportunity to uh, develop our pool of trainers because um, our trainers um, come uh, from the industry. They are career journalists who have much to offer in terms of experience and practical skills. So we took advantage of the lockdown periods to refresh our TTT, uh, well, train the trainer courses, uh, and then also to develop an ETTT, which is an e-trainer um, and <laughs> so many TTs, but, and then the new TTET, uh, which is trainers who develop e-learning courses. So, um, yeah, we've had the opportunity to um, just take some time and, and develop our capacity um, in, in that short period. Um, going forward, um, we certainly will be looking for more collaboration. Um, doing more curating of existing content and contextualizing that content because um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel and there's so much information available already. So collaboration is key. Um, we have uh, the understanding that there's need for new skills um, to respond to the new digital demands, understanding that journalism has changed. Um, 
and keeping our close connection with the newsroom. I mean, th there are certain things that I think I've picked up. This, the, the fact that for journalists in the field, that face-to-face -face interview, I mean, we are all talking about digital issues and technology and so forth and so on, but that face-to-face -face interview is so critical to look someone in the eye, to study their body language. Um, I think it takes away some flavor from the final product and possibly some truth. Um, so, yeah, okay. just some comments. Sure, thanks very much, Zoe. Um, I was struck by what you said about WhatsApp training. I mean, what does that look like? Does that look like a one hour voice note that's a, re that's a lecture that you send out or what does it look like? It's uh, a combination of voice notes. Um, there's a lot of interaction, a combination of voice notes. It's uh, short video clips. Obviously, uh, being familiar with a platform, uh, you can't send out huge file sizes. Um, so, I mean, uh, audio content is, is not going to be perfect. Um, and the video, um, be mindful of, of, of the file sizes. Um, the what journalists enjoyed about it is, you know, the novelty. They actually enjoyed that more than anything else. The novelty mm. of training on WhatsApp, uh, the fact that it was a lot more interactive um, and it was a curated group. Uh, so, yes, um, I mean, we that was being used for the course or the module social media verification because, I mean, we were all concerned about the spread of fake news, disinformation and so forth and so on. So that was the emphasis um, for, for rolling the WhatsApp uh, training. Mm -hmm. I was a bit concerned, you know, um, at the beginning of the year when we all received this notification from WhatsApp and the migration of people from WhatsApp to um, other platforms, but um, I think many, many people will remain with WhatsApp, um, mm -hmm. but there's no reason why it can't be emulated on Signal or, um, or other platforms. well, uh, Telegram or, or yeah, other platforms. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Most interesting. Um, so, I mean, just a reminder, my name is Franz Krieger. I'm in conversation with uh, Monica Chibita from um, um, Marion Walton from UCT and Zoe Titus from Namibia. We're talking about year two of teaching journalism under COVID. I'd like to invite people to, to, to post questions or comments or experiences. I mean, we've already heard a great deal and I think um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Monica, let me just quickly go back to you and say and ask you, um, do you think that there are new opportunities here that we, we should exploit? I mean, Zoe's talked about uh, using WhatsApp as a platform? Are there beyond a return to some kind of normality you think you'll stay, keep in your toolbox? You're uh, muted. That is my perennial crime, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think there are lots of new opportunities. There are certain things we have done, but I'll start with a broader thing. In terms of across the, the partnership, this partnership, uh, there are possibilities for, for example, for teaching some courses together. There's no reason two universities cannot agree that if we are both teaching data journalism, we combine our classes and see how to teach that class together. It will be a much more diverse experience and so on, and it doesn't cost much more. Um, and also expertise is much easier to get now. You don't have to fly somebody in. So that's, that's an opportunity. Um, we have found that students are in themselves a great resource because finally they are able to use tools that they've used for years for other things, for learning. And, and I think it's important to harness this. And we've done this a lot in our classes asking them to record content ahead of time and share their screens and so on in lieu of the practical face-to-face -face classes that we normally have. So, so I do see a lot of opportunities uh, there. We can talk about some more as we go along, but those, those are ones that come to mind immediately. We can also do short courses together, uh, mid-career training courses together um, mm. with an international flavor and so on. 
I mean, th that's a that's an opportunity. It's also potentially a threat, right? Um, I mean, we haven't seen this so far, but there's not a great deal preventing the Columbia's of the world, or City University in London, or uh, you know, to offer things online, and then uh, it's as easy for a student in Kampala or in Cape Town um, to register with the big international names in our very space. Um, and, uh, you know, basically go there rather than come to us. I mean, we haven't seen that yet, but do you think that that's on the cards? I hadn't thought about that, but it's an interesting one. I, I hadn't thought about it at all, but yes, I think um, what's the university that offered a lot of free courses before I forget? I think it's MIT. MIT was already doing this anyway. But, uh, but I think people's eyes have been opened now. And yes, that might, it might affect our numbers. It might have, so it cuts both ways, I guess. And I, and I guess, um, I mean, that could also be an opportunity for us. I mean, we, you know, if we, as you say, put together an online course that deals with data journalism, um, I mean, we could make that available to anybody in the world, really. Yeah, that's um, true. I mean, it feels like right at the moment we've got enough on our plate. <laughs> yes, yes. But we have to get out of this that's, mode. Yeah. Um, in a sense, even in journalism training as in so much else, we're in a global marketplace, aren't we? I mean, mm -hmm. we're competing against, against everyone. Um, I, I wondered, I, I mean, you, you talked about um, the cohort, Marion, that of yours in video production that has yeah, been... Um, I mean, what have you seen in terms of intakes? I mean, do we, have you seen reduced numbers coming in this year because of the uncertainty? And of course, people are going, uh, confronting a, a job environment that is very, very different to, um, to what they've been used to. I mean, are our numbers up? Are they down? Are there different, different kinds of people coming forward? Um, how, what has been the impact on that, on that front, do you think? Um, so I think it is it is um, pretty much business as usual usual in terms of UCT as a whole. So we've heard that our registration, despite a callingly complicated online registration process, uh, we somehow managed to register ninety nine percent of our usual usual intake. So I think you know the kind of dinner party southern suburbs where parents claim to be sending their, their kids off to MIT or Harvard online or whatever, that didn't really happen. Um, it's usually just, yeah. So I, I think for various reasons, that's not um, really a factor. Um, we know how hard it is to maintain any kind of discipline to really connect with those courses. We know what the incredibly poor success rate is of MOOCs. So it's pathetic. Um, if we were worried about our dropouts last year, Monica, you just have to look at the Harvard MOOCs um, to really feel better about uh, what we managed to pull off with vastly fewer resources at our disposal. So I think I'm absolutely excited about the idea of working together. I think uh, there are these online resources. As I said, we did rely heavily on them. They, with the things where we don't have to start from scratch for something like data journalism. We've always kind of borrowed and gleaned materials from, um, from other contexts, but they're never really suitable for our students. And you know, the data itself is always, a, they're big issues with it. It needs to be decolonized. And um, I think for us to work together on a module like that sounds like a really exciting option for me, partly because I've already worked on materials with colleagues from WITS um, with Leslie, who I saw in the, in the chat there, um, got us started with some very, um, I thought, great workshop uh, concepts, uh, which actually acknowledge that our students uh, come into journalism with vastly um, reduced math skills and also with huge attitude issues. So this might not be the case in other African countries, but South African students notoriously underserved by maths teaching at high school level. And so not assuming that everyone who's do doing data journalism would have, you know, complete confidence and a sense of themselves as some, someone who's able to crunch numbers at any time. So I think by acknowledging and understanding those <clears throat> aspects of our context and as well um, the exciting opportunities that uh, Monica talked about learning from the skills that our students already, uh, you know, kind of 
trendsetters in the digital space and being able to um, take notice of what they're already doing, what they already understand and set those as um, assessment topics. So instead of making a huge visualization that assumes that you've got a massive big screen, what about thinking about visualizations that actually work on WhatsApp that can be forwarded without, you know, that shocking kind of loss of context and so on that often happens when um, visualizations from News24 get shared, uh, for example, in family WhatsApp groups. So I think uh, looking at these issues that are local in some cases, which actually affect us all on the continent in other cases, um, and which where we can just be so much more enriched by looking beyond the boundaries of individual in institutions. I think that would be a fantastic thing to follow up after today. Mm. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, I certainly echo your, uh, your views on MOOCs. I've never been persuaded by MOOCs. Um, I mean, the numbers sound amazing until you look at how many ex people actually come out at the other end. Um, and those numbers are always very poor, or I mean, yeah, always very poor. Um, I think the actual learning that goes on there is, is, is minimal. Um, I, I just want to again uh, invite people into the conversation. I mean, I see that there are um, people here from a number of organizations and places, um, Ethiopia, Mauritius, um, other institutions in Johannesburg, colleagues here at WITS. Please do join us. I'm sure you've got insights um, uh, to throw into the conversation. I mean, I'm really interested in this idea of, of creating um, joint courses, I suppose, is what we're saying, which, uh, you know, which can be built and made available, you know, between different institutions. I mean, we've heard data journalism, we've heard, uh, I mean, you've talked about just dealing with numbers generally, Marion, um, or using, I mean, data visualization on, on, on simpler platforms. I mean, those seem to offer themselves um, as really fantastic um, opportunities. I mean, do we envisage those kind of things as being, um, a, you know, elaborately constructed because of course you know we can spend even if they're simple at the other end I mean you can put we had an experience of one course being developed two courses being developed um, over six months and it took a phenomenal amount of time so that's a huge investment um, I mean Zoe you've developed courses very quickly it sounds to me um, I mean how what has been the success what has been the recipe there um, to develop courses there quite um, quite quickly. Um, it comes down to collaboration. Um, I think that that is at the centre of um, a lot of the successes that we've had. Um, as I've indicated, our training pool comes from working journalists in the event that there are skills missing. We go and look for those skills. Um, and bring on board curriculum developers um, and experts from different fields outside of journalism um, to assist us with uh, um, developing um, course modules um, and just thinking through the, the, the del uh, delivery strategy. Sure. So it's collaboration, really, drawing on expertise in, dif in different places. Yeah. I We've had to develop these courses very quickly. Um, emergency remote teaching, as I said earlier, was the phrase, the phrase that's been used. I mean, Monica, you're finding that there is an opportunity now to go back and kind of rework that offering um, in a more systematic way. Uh, or are you mostly simply continue with the models that you've developed? Um, if you could clarify a little bit on the offering. Well, I mean, if you've, you know, we, we had to move pivot in a week or two weeks, um, mm -hmm. you know, to a module, a mode of teaching, uh, call it audio journalism, just to use it as an example, we kind of scrambled, put it together, here's a Zoom session, there's some yes. you can share as an exercise, there's, you know what I mean, are you, are you, are you finding that there is an opportunity now to, to revisit that and kind of do it a little bit more systematically? I, I think so. Um, I, I do not teach a lot of practical courses, but I've spoken to colleagues who do, and, mm. and I think there is an opportunity. And I think that opportunity comes with combining the knowledge of, you know, the technical things that you do with WhatsApp, etc., and equipment, 
and pedagogy because a lot of times the pedagogy suffers when you're dealing with a crisis and so on. I think to bear in mind those important things of what are my learning outcomes, how do they relate to the, to the, to the exercises that I'm giving um, and so on, I think is, is very important. So I, I think there's an opportunity to go back and be a lot more intentional. We now have an opportunity to pre-record our lectures and that gives you a chance to think through your lecture much better and pre-record it. And if you're going to teach something practical, ask your students, for example, to record their material much earlier and have it ready so that if you're going to learn editing, they have something to draw from already. And those are things that we kind of did on the, on the, on the run in the past, on the go. But now we have to be very intentional about because it is so important to hold those students. Mm. Yeah. Is, do you feel that you're getting enough um, support from the university itself in terms of the techniques and, um, and approaches that are necessary for this very new and different way of working? The university has set up a, a couple of committees. One of them is, a, is an e-learning committee that, um, that trains everybody. I think the problem is not so much the availability of training, it's the willingness of, of faculty to do the training. So we have a lot of opportunities and lots of skills. We actually realize now that there are lots of things that we have been teaching and looking for people to teach. And we have that expertise domiciled somewhere else in the university, but we didn't know. So they invited us for, for training last week and we attended and they know so much that we need that we are going to partner with them. But we didn't even know there was an opportunity for partnership there. So I think the university is doing what it can to support, but uh, the buy-in is slow. Mm -hmm. I suppose it's a different mindset, isn't it, for all of yeah. us? In this, in this, in this field, um, I, I want to turn to uh, just before we close. I want to turn to the kind of broader picture. Um, I mean, Marion, I wonder whether you've thought at all about uh, with your colleagues about how the the changes in the landscape more widely also affect what we need to do to prepare students for very different roles and relationships um, with audiences in a very different. Kind of working environment um, as as students graduate from from our programs. Um, thanks, Brian. I think we've you know some of us have been thinking about it for a while. Uh, sure. Just in terms of getting, um, I'm not talking about COVID now, but really uh, the, the not underestimating um, the kind of digital skills that people need in order to not just thrive but actually to survive um, currently and so I'm not you know I'm not somebody who reduces journalism to coding or anything like that um, but I think to some extent our uh, ability to shift away from the video framework last year um, there was uh, we also have options for students who can combine um, majors in media with uh, information systems for example so I think, you know, the depths of skills that are required um, actually require much broader interdisciplinary thinking in our curricula, rather than thinking, well, we can teach them coding in four weeks or whatever. It's actually understand this is, these are deep fields of scholarly work and practical skills. So the, you know, students who did have information systems as a co-major last year were able to continue doing very impressive uh, multimedia projects um, because they'd had two years of learning coding um, but within the context of information systems as a discipline uh, together with what we hope is a kind of critical edge storytelling advantage that they can get from media and combination of our media and journalism courses. So uh, I, I would say that at the same time as I agree, we need to be kind of gleaning what we can, including short courses as much as possible, um, helping people to adapt their, you know, their skill sets on the fly. It's also not to underestimate, um, you know, what it takes to really get going. And that's for us as well as for our students. Um, mm -hmm. So for us to shift and to really be able to prepare students to think about 
engaging with audiences today. Um, partly it's the skills that we already have of ethnography and you know, qualitative research and so on. But as much we are now dealing with people who are getting feedback from data, from you know, their publishers. So here's the data. These are the analytics of what, you know, this is your story sank like a lead balloon on social mm -hmm. media. And um, so there are skills there which you don't necessarily just build up in um, a, a, a short course. Um, and oh. I think it's that having that sense from ourselves and our colleagues that we can go for additional training and um, that also to have the confidence that our qualitative insights are desperately needed because of the way that the you know, data about audiences is so problematic in so many ways, not just because of privacy, but also because of the assumptions of people who are collecting the data and the lenses that they might be looking at um, information that somebody with a different training might be seeing very differently. So I think there's a big picture there as well as the, yes, there are opportunities for us here that we should be seizing in terms of the form of short courses, but also putting our heads together. We don't all have to know how to do everything. And I think this is a case where we, we absolutely can't. And um, the colleagues in, the in our department who were enthusiastic about developing materials, and it wasn't everybody, but the ones who were really got together and figured out how to do it. And I think that's just been inspiring for me. And it's certainly, there's no reason that we can't do that across the, um, the barriers of what institutions we belong to. I think it'll be massively enriching for all of us and for our students, um, if we can pull off a couple of modules like that. I don't even mean, you know, full courses or whatever, mm. but to understand that modules which are developed and work well somewhere have been tried and tested can be shared and can, you know, we can bring people in uh, without necessarily getting our institutions to understand how the, you know, how exactly we're collaborating. Sure. So thanks for that, Marion. And I think that's a, a great kind of note and, and point at which to draw this discussion to a close. Of course, it doesn't end here. Um, I mean, we will, it's an ongoing discussion. And um, uh, I want to thank you all for participating in it today. Um, both those who listened in, as well as the panel, Monica Chibita from Uganda, um, Marion Walton from UCG, and Zoe Titus from uh, the Namibia Media Trust. Um, I, I, you know, the, the notion that we can work together, that we can learn from each other, and that there are therefore opportunities that actually arise from the difficult crisis that we're in um, is, a, is a fantastic one um, that we need to take forward. Uh, as you probably know, we do have now a newsletter called Agenda, which we publish. If you want, to, if you're not on that mailing list and you want to be added to, please let us know. Um, and we really hope to continue the interaction. I think we need, we're finding our way as to what the best way is to to build this sense of collegiality, of cooperation between, as Marion says, different institutions in different countries. But thank you very much. It's been a great discussion. Let's continue it. Thanks a lot.